So thank you very much for coming today in the evening. And I'll speak on the topic of when strengths become weaknesses and when weaknesses become strengths. So I'll broadly talk this in three parts that how our strengths can be our weaknesses, then how our weaknesses can be our strengths and how spiritual growth can enable us to use both our strengths and our weaknesses constructively. So recently I was at a conference on spirituality and creativity. So where creativity refers to either it can be writing or it can be painting or creativity can manifest in even everyday activities, how we decorate our house and a hundred other things. Here specifically it was about creative artists, primal writers and there is one alarming fact about creativity that in the last century, the 20th century, the 10 writers who are considered to be top writers, every single one of them committed suicide. So why is it that people who are very creative, they sometimes seem to have a lot of angst, a lot of agony, a lot of depression. Obviously they are phenomenal talented. So they have a great strength, but somehow it just isn't leverage. In their writing they are phenomenal, but it's almost seen as a, in creative circles, it's seen that any kind of creativity is associated with mental instability. I know one of the most famous cartoonists in India, I met him once at a program. So he said that I just can't draw unless I drink. <laughs> so it's, that's, that's what starts me. So is it that in order to access our strengths, in this case the creative strength, that one has to actually go through mental trauma or put in substances within oneself that abuse, that hurt our body. So if we look at the history of the world, we live today in what is called, what we can call broadly as the age of information. And this information age is the culmination of the scientific revolution that started around the 16th century. And now if somebody is very talented, we may say you are a genius. Now before the 16th century, whether it was in India or in the West, people's language was different. The language was not that you are a genius, but you have a genius in you. Now what is the difference? The idea here was that you, when you say you have a genius and this is universal language. The, the idea over there was that you know, there is something higher, bigger than you that is manifesting through you. And certainly, if somebody is able to dance brilliantly, somebody is able to do any sports, sports activity brilliantly, somebody is able to write or sing brilliantly, they have to be appreciated, they are even awed that they are able to do it so well. But along with that, it's also to be understood that something bigger than them is manifesting through them. And anybody who is creative, nowadays psychologists talk about flow. So get into your flow, then you will have peak performance. Or if we consider cricket, you know, sometimes the players are in form. And sometimes the best players are out of form. Now nobody wants to be out of form. So when they are in form, it's almost if a batsman is in form, they just know where the ball is going to come, how to hit the ball. And they can be very creative and everything seems to go right. And the next day, it might be the same batsman plays the same shot and makes a complete mess of it. So the point here is that we all can have particular gifts. Some of us have far more gifts than others. A few of us may have phenomenally more gifts than others. But still, the point is that they are gifts. And when we start thinking 
that our abilities are our abilities. When we think of our abilities as belonging to us, not as bestowed to us. When that happens, then if we are not able to perform as we think we should or as we have done earlier, then it becomes unbearable. What's wrong with me? Why am I not able to do this? And when we take credit for our abilities, for our strengths, for our gifts, actually it is too, it is too big a burden for any human being to take. You may think, oh, my abilities are not a burden. They are an asset, they are a strength. Yes, it is. But to, to claim sole proprietorship of our abilities is to put an unbearable burden on ourselves. Because those abilities are something higher working through us. And now that higher thing, whatever it is, it may work wonderfully at times and whenever it works, we can be delighted, we can be grateful, we can use to the best of our capacity. But to the extent we think that that ability is mine. And when that ability seems to have deserted us, then what do we do at that time? Just lost. We just lost. I had a very striking experience of this last year. I had come, I had gone to Silicon Valley in America and I, gave, I spoke on the same topic at three places. I spoke in Intel, I spoke in Google and then I spoke at Stanford. And at Intel, the audience was very receptive. At Google, people were okay, okay. And at Stanford, it was like almost every point I was speaking, every second point I was speaking, people were either like laughing or clapping. And when I compared those three, it was almost 80 to 90 percent I had spoken the same thing. So I was trying to figure out what was the difference. And then it struck me that when I speak, I try my best to speak as well as I can. And there are times when I speak and throughout the class or the audience is looking at me, as if they are watching a foreign language movie without subtitles. <laughs> so nothing seems, nothing seems to be connecting. And sometimes the connection happens so well. So, so when we claim that my strengths are my strengths alone, the result of that is that we on one side, we may, we may feel elated. Oh, I am so good. But the flip side of that is, we will feel devastated. We will feel deep, deflated, even devastated, when we are not able to perform. Now we may say, but I have to perform. I have my studies, I have my job, I have this thing. I have to perform. Yes, certainly, we would like to do the best that we can at all times. But the nature of the world and the nature of reality is that sometimes we can do well, sometimes we can't do well. And when we are not able to do as well as we would like to, at that time, how we look at ourselves, how we look at the situation will determine how much the ups and downs of our performance will lead to ups and downs in our moods. I was speaking at uh, Massachusetts last year and one professor from there had come and we were discussing after the talk about how students suffer from enormous levels of stress in the Ivy League University. So he was co quoting one uh, big survey that had been done in the Ivy Leagues and they said that students over there, now if you consider the Ivy Leagues, the students over there are brilliant. To get there is not at all easy. But this survey showed that most of the students go through two primary emotional states. One is grandiosity and the other is inferiority. Grandiosity means I am so great, I am grand. So whenever they are interacting with someone who is lesser than them, maybe who has less CGPA than them, is less 
less talented than them, less smarter than them, then they feel good about themselves. So they have this vision of grandiosity and I am going to conquer the world. But whenever they interact with someone who is better than them and in, the world is such a place that even in the area that we consider ourselves the best, sooner or later somebody will come who is better than us. So, what happens, whenever they interact with somebody who is better than them, then they start feeling inferiority. Inferiority, insecurity. So this is not just for students, this happens to all of us in life. So, to the extent we look at ourselves solely in terms of our talents and the products of those talents, we will be very insecure will be very very insecure. We might be very successful and we might be very elated but along with that we have we will also be subject to enormous depression, negativity. So the strength, the talents that we have they can become our weakness if we identify too much with them. So the Bhagavad Gita explains that our abilities are not our entitlements, they are our endowments. That means they have been given to us. Paurusham Rushu. In the seventh chapter, eight verse, the Bhagavad Gita says that it is the divine who manifests through us. It is Krishna who manifests through us as our abilities. So whatever good anyone has, it is a spark of God manifesting through them. That wherever we see anything impressive, we understand that there is a spark of the divine manifesting through this person. And if something good comes through us, we also understand that there is a spark of the divine manifesting through us. Now, because if it is, it is manifesting through us, so we can consider ourselves fortunate. We can consider ourselves blessed. But if we know there is something higher manifesting through me, then we won't become too proud of it. We won't become possessive about it. And we won't become so devastated if something, some, if sometimes that creativity doesn't manifest through us. So for us, the strengths that we have, I'll put this as a three level statement, to have ability, to have gifts, you could say, to have gifts is fortune. To know that we have gifts is a bigger fortune. Now some people say that I have many hidden talents. The problem is they are hidden even from me. <laughs> <laughs> so, some of us may have some abilities, we may not even know about it. So, to have gifts is fortunate. To know that we have gifts is more fortunate. To know that our gifts are gifts, that is most fortunate. To know that our gifts are actually gifts, that is most fortunate. And it is our spirituality which can take us to this third level. So spirituality is not just about, you know, maybe doing some meditation or doing some breathing exercises or maybe going to some place which makes us feel good. All that is fine. All that can be a part of spirituality. But the essence of spirituality is to see our connection with the whole. To see that we are parts of a whole and that our connectedness with the whole is what will bring us stability. So in the world, we will all go through ups and downs. We will sometimes succeed, we will sometimes fail. And sometimes we may fail because the other person was better than us. Sometimes we may fail because we were worse than ourselves. You know, when something goes wrong or when we are we are defeated because the other person is better, 
it's it's still it is still annoying it is still irritating but it's okay what can i what can i do this person is better than me but when we get thwarted in something because we did not do as well as we could at that time it's very easy to beat ourselves up i am such a fool i am such a fool i am such a fool but there is a difference between taking responsibility for one's actions and blaming oneself for one action one's actions taking responsibility means i am here this action is here i acknowledge that i did this wrong and i'll do what i can to make amends for it that's taking responsibility but blaming oneself means to forever define oneself or equate oneself with that action and to just keep beating oneself up again and again and again and again and blaming is not at all good blaming others is not good at all but blaming ourselves is also not good we need to definitely take responsibility and see you know could i have done something better and we can always learn and try to do better something better but the important thing is at sometimes we just did what we could in that situation and it was not good enough so our spirituality gives us a vision of ourselves as a part of something bigger than ourselves and does if some ups and downs happen then we don't obsess over them too much we can just okay at that time things didn't work out but that doesn't mean things will never work out that doesn't necessarily mean that i am doomed it just means that time the things didn't work out see failure is an event in our life failure is not the defining event of our life it's one event sometimes we don't do so well but it's not the defining event even if you see i talked about how when people start they have genius within them or they are geniuses when you say that person is a genius then you are a genius and you know you are performing worse than a novice now what's happening so but if you have genius within you that means something higher is manifesting through you and from whoever that higher is manifesting we need to appreciate that that person has talent and they need to be respected and they need to respect their talents also no but there are two aspects to it we need to protect our talents and nourish them so that they grow but we also need to protect ourselves from our talents we need to protect ourselves from our talents that means if somebody is phenomenally talented then it's very easy if they can keep performing for them to become very arrogant i am so great and you no know, there are two different things one is we perform well and we get satisfaction in that the second is we perform well and then get a sense of get a ego inflation now say see i am better than everyone else i am so good so that is what will lead to arrogance and in the world the nature is such that whatever we get pleasure through we become attached to that and then through that very thing we can get trouble say now the cricket world cup is coming up say now india of if we become very attached to cricket sometimes i don't know i have not seen in american streets but indian streets sometimes you see you see young boys young men walking along they're just walking on the road and they're swinging a bat <laughs> no no there is no bat there is no ball there is <laughs> but they are in their mental world is swinging <laughs> so what they just caught in that now when they are caught like that if somebody is very attached to cricket the sports as a exercise is good sports as a entertainment in a proportionate sense is good but sports as a obsession that is unhealthy so now suppose somebody is attached to cricket and say if the indian team wins and we become elated you know we become elated but then say the next match indian team loses and then i say okay i'm detached from cricket <laughs> it's not that easy if we are attached to something to the extent we delight in india's victory to that extent we will face agony when india gets defeated so 
everything in this world to the extent we seek pleasure through it to that extent we can get pain through it also so same way if we take we perform well and we get satisfaction through the performance that's wonderful and if you are not able to perform well okay i couldn't perform well next time i'll try better that's fine but if we perform and then we get pleasure from the praise and the adulation that we get from the world and then we are not able to perform and then people no longer praise us people no longer appreciate us that will become unbearable the bhagavad gita says sambhavitasya cha kirtir maranad tirichyate says in 134 that for one who has been honored dishonor can be worse than death so going back to the point about how many of the artists many of the top authors end up committing suicide what happens with them now of course each case of suicide can be very complicated but still we can look at some generic patterns what happens to them is that they write some phenomenal book and they may win a nobel prize or they may pulitzer prize or they make millions of dollars and what happens by that is they become so famous they become so celebrated as great authors and then after that they write something and it doesn't come out that good so when that happens you know i wrote i did something like that and now what is coming out of this what will people say what will the reviewer say how will i live with this then it becomes unbearable so for all of us many of you are parents and we have children also over here so i'll conclude this part of the talk with one point and then we can have questions you know we all need to ensure that we give ourselves and our children intrinsic self worth not extrinsic self worth what is the difference see extrinsic self worth is achievement centered intrinsic self worth is commitment centered so if we praise our children when they achieve something special when they get a very high marks in their exam or when they do very well in their sports or in their music they win some award win some trophy uh, win some recognition when we appreciate them like certainly we should appreciate them for that but when that is the only time we appreciate them then what happen they start thinking that only if i do this my parents will love me only if i do this then i have some worth so their self worth gets tied to the achievement now all of us want achievement we want those whom we love also to achieve things definitely but achievement centered appreciation leads to extrinsic self worth and that creates a lot of insecurity whereas commitment centered appreciation means that if they did their part if they did their practice they did their studies they did as well as they could we appreciate that and of course if they achieve that more appreciation but the appreciation if it is tied only to achievement then it eventually leads into insecurity but if the appreciation is centered on commitment then even if they don't achieve today that commitment will carry them through and they will achieve tomorrow so intrinsic self worth comes based on doing what is in our control extrinsic self worth comes when we get something that is not in our control in every situation commitment is in our control but achievement is not in our control we can commit and do the best that we can in any situation but we we can the world is too unpredictable we can't guarantee that we will achieve something so so our strengths or the sense of our loved ones or children or others they can become weaknesses if we start identifying those strengths as our strengths and if you start thinking that my self worth comes only from this ability but what spiritual knowledge tells us is that each one of us is a soul each one of us is a precious part of god there's a spark of divinity within each one of us and whether something we are able to do something extraordinary or not there is intrinsic self worth to every one of us and with this understanding we can go through life's ups and downs with greater steadiness 
with lesser emotional turbulence. So that was the first point I was going to make. Any comments or questions at this point? Yes, please. Okay, good question. I'll come to that when I talk about weaknesses, but I'll answer briefly right now. Okay, so Sorry, what was the yeah, I'll repeat it. So just as strengths are manifested through us, our weaknesses also manifested through us. That means is it somebody? Uh, uh, is it like some malevolent being who is acting through us and making us do wrong things? Well. Yes and no, I would say. Mm, at one level, we could say that wherever we are weak, what is happening is, if, say, if you consider electricity, there are three broad kinds of material broadly, broadly speaking. There are conductors, there are semiconductors and there are insulators. Mm. So now the electricity might be arriving at a particular point, but if what is there afterwards is an insulator then the electricity will not flow through. So for all of us, we are all connected with the divine. But with respect to various abilities, with respect to some abilities, we are conductors. So somebody can sing brilliantly. Now it's as if they start singing and they get transported to a different world, they transport everyone else to a different world. So it means with respect to singing ability, they are conductors. But Sometimes even those who are very good singers, now they might have a very poor memory. Now some people, you ask them their name and then they tell them, or you tell your name, you talk with them 15 minutes and by the end, what was your name? So you know, they just forget. It's not that they are, they don't care, but just they forget. So with respect to that memory, somebody might just be an insulator. So they just, it just doesn't work for them. So all of us, you know, all of us have some or the other painful inadequacy. That's just the way we are. We are finite beings and everyone has some painful inadequacy. Now we can work to improve that. That's, that's where our weaknesses come into the picture. But the point is with respect to that, we may be insulators. Uh, there are some people who are, who are tone deaf. You know, it's like... Uh, I happen to be one of them. So I just don't get, see the worst part of music is somebody is doing some very nice music, somebody is singing and playing some instrument nicely and somebody else comes up and starts picking a kartal and playing. And it's one thing to know that I'm not playing right, playing right. And then they try to consciously play right. But some people, they play wrong and they don't even know they're playing wrong. <laughs> so with their closed eyes, they're meeting the kartal and they are in ecstasy. And everyone around them in his agony. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> so what happens is that sometimes with respect to some things, we might just be insulators. So it's not necessary that something higher is manifesting that weakness through them. It's just that we have a particular body mind. It has certain abilities, certain inabilities. So that is one category of weakness we could talk about. Where? We just are insulators for something. So that particular thing doesn't manifest through us. The other could also be that we, <clears throat> when we talk about weaknesses, we can have many different things within it. One is inabilities. Say, like not, you can't sing properly or can't write properly or can't remember certain things. But apart from that, weaknesses could also be something like moral shortcomings. Some people might be very sh given to a lot of anger. Some people might be given to a lot of greed or envy or something like that. Now these are not something which are going to be for forever. So if some people are tone deaf and that's how they will be. It's very difficult for them to change that. But even if somebody is very angry, now that doesn't mean that they have to be angry lifelong. They may not be able to become very even tempered, but we all can decrease the anger. So if we are referring to weaknesses in that sense, say if somebody is very temperamental, and they just get excited very quickly. Now they might not become completely stoic, but they can decrease that. They can decrease that. So uh, with respect to weaknesses of this kind, it's not exactly something uh, different from us, some, something higher manifesting to us, rather 
it is that the way we have acted repeatedly that action becomes stored within us like a program say if somebody has so our mind you could say like a computer program and so the in the three level reality there is the body the physical reality then there is the mind which is inside us and inside beyond that there is the soul so if you compare to a computer system there is the hardware the software and the user so the body is like the hardware the mind is like the software and the soul or the consciousness is like the user so now suppose somebody has visited a particular site repeatedly say they have visited bollywood.com mm. and they visited many times and now they come for a spiritual program and they hear about the bhagavad gita they say it sounds interesting let me read more about it and after the program they go home and they type in their browser bhagavad gita so they start typing b and what happens bollywood, <laughs> bollywood comes up <laughs> now they may not want to go to bollywood but what has happened what they had chosen previously that comes up as a auto complete now somebody else who has not chosen bollywood the type b nothing might come or various options might come so basically now this something coming through something coming as a auto complete we could say that it is something different from us at that point i don't want that bollywood to come there but it is just coming so when we when you talk about weaknesses like say greed or anger or even depression or whatever some people some small things go wrong and they just get so depressed i was at a semi i was at a conference on uh, spirituality and mental health so one girl was telling about how spir her spirituality helped her she said how she sank into depression she was saying that once she was she was studying in a good university but along with that to earn some money she was waiting she was american in this in america so she was waiting tables so once some she was carrying some water in a plate for uh, water in, a, in her hand only to give to a client a customer and somehow that water slipped from her hand and it just fell with a big crash and she started thinking i can't even carry a glass of water what will i ever be able to do in my life <laughs> and just that one glass of water falling from her hands triggered a incident of depression now how many of us have had water slipping from our hands <laughs> is it so many times it happens but what happened over there is she had a difficult childhood and she had low self esteem she had insecurity and that one small incident triggered that big catastrophic reaction within her so now this might not happen to most people so is it something else manifesting through us well you could say that that it is the programming of our mind which brings certain thoughts as default and with respect to this going back to the earlier example you know we for the higher energy to manifest we should be conductors but for the negative programming when it starts manifesting we need to become insulators yes this thought is coming within me but i don't have to have to give in to it i don't have to give in to it so if we give in to it sometimes we may do something and then we ourselves wonder why did i do that why did i speak like that i didn't want to but it just happens so it's not there is there's no mal no malevolent being who benefits and as as our weaknesses but rather the accumulated choices they create impressions within us and so every action that we do it becomes stored within us as a impression in our mind and every impression comes out as a proposition so action leads to impression impression comes as a proposition proposition means do it again so once something goes wrong and we we react in a particular way to it say we get disheartened we get depressed the next time we do something wrong again that response will come stronger but we can change that do you answer your question yes sir thank you any other questions or comments okay so i'll continue this second part now about how our weaknesses can be our strengths so i talked about weaknesses your question was a good link for that now with respect to weaknesses as i said some weaknesses can be certain inabilities in terms of lacking certain talents and certain weaknesses can be 
इमोशनल इनसिक्योरिटीज और एंगर ग्रीड लास्ट एंड वी दिस काइंड ऑफ थिंग्स ना इधर वे इफ वी जस्ट लुक एट द वीकनेस एंड वाई डू आई फील लाइक दिस वाई डू आई एक्ट लाइक दिस वाई डू आई डू लाइक दिस दैट कै इफ यू जस्ट कीप ऑब्सेसिंग ओवर आर वीकनेस देन दैट कैन वीकनेस फर्दर दैट कैन डिसहार्टन एस बट द टू थिंग्स दैट कैन हैपन हाउ वीकनेसेस कैन बिकम स्ट्रेंथ्स वन इज इफ आर वीकनेसेस क्रिएट ह्यूमिलिटी विद इन अस इफ आर वीकनेसेस कैन क्रिएट ह्यूमिलिटी ना वॉट डू आई मीन बाई ह्यूमिलिटी ना वट इज the whole culture is that you you put forward your best face you promote yourself one of my students he one of my friends he studied under me so he he recently graduated from iim and he was telling me that we learn how to inflate our cv systematically so he said uh if there is a water tap that is on and we are passing by somewhere and we turn off the water tap we add it in our cv as i am a activist for water conservation on the planet <laughs> so the ethos today is that people blow their own trumpet quite a bit so and to some extent if we want to be hired for a job we have to give our cv so you have to tell what all we have done so what what does humility mean in today's context so humility does not mean that we deny our abilities humility doesn't mean that we let others trample over us humility simply means that we don't let our ego come in the way of our purpose i repeat humility means that we don't let our ego come in the way of our purpose our purpose means we have to do something so for example if you are working in a team then we might be the senior most member of the team we might most experienced or the most highly positioned and we come up with a plan to achieve something and then some subordinate some team member comes up with something alternative which is better but you know how dare how dare this this upstart who does it who does who do they think they are this is my plan so then what happens there if we consider that my purpose is to complete this project or do this service or get this thing done and this person suggestion can do this more efficient effectively than what i can do then i don't let my ego come in the way of my purpose so humility is an asset in today's corporate culture people may not talk about humility but everybody talks about team spirit and humility and team spirit are simply two sides of the same coin if i have humility then i can have team spirit if somebody doesn't have humility then what happens they want all the credit for themselves it is said that whenever there is success success has many parents <laughs> and failure is always an orphan <laughs> oh, not me it is because of that person because of that person because of that person because of that person so humility can be an asset our weaknesses what so humility as i said it can be an asset in building team spirit and our weaknesses can foster humility so how does humility help us individual level or at individual level also our weakness so if we have strengths and we are always doing good with our strengths then we start thinking we, we start thinking you know i am great and then when we start thinking i am great it's only a small step forward from there to become arrogant arrogance arrogance is where we think that everybody else is wrong now some people are so so sure that their opinion is right they say i could agree with you 
but then both of us would be wrong <laughs> <laughs> so they are just not ready to consider anyone else's opinion so what happens in such a situation is that we lose out on whatever others could bring other whatever insights whatever wisdom whatever ideas others could bring in but we also alienate others so if we have strengths naturally we will use those strengths but focusing only on our strengths and identifying with those strengths can very easily lead to arrogance but if we have certain weaknesses and we acknowledge those weaknesses not necessarily that we have to parade those weaknesses over everyone else but just yes you know this is something i'm not good at, that good at that means that i'm not i'm not god i'm not perfect at everything so that that humility can become a big strength because that humility can help us to take inputs from others to do course correction whenever it is required even the best athletes best sports players need coaches but because you, know, you can't think about everything it's always better to have some other perspective to enhance our perspective to broaden our perspective so weaknesses can become strengths because we become open to others and weaknesses can not only increase humility weaknesses can also increase our spirituality how does that happen that is because if we understand that i have this weakness you know i have this anger issue i have this 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 maybe i have a mind which is very unstable then that may make us seek help from some power bigger than ourselves at one level we might seek help from a friend we might seek help from a counselor from a therapist all that is good but we need some higher help beyond all this and our spirit so when we turn towards the divine uh, in prayer that is not to some people say that actually you know, there was a movie called pk some of you may know about it you know it was so it was about how people go to god one of the dialogues over there was that people who become fearful they go to temple jo dar gaya wo mandir gaya well i wrote a book uh, responding to that uh, that movie is called gk for pk <laughs> so gk was three levels there is general knowledge god knowledge and gita knowledge so there are many valid points and there is definitely many superstitions that can happen in religion there is a lot of exploitation that happens in religion but the idea is that okay so you could say that jo jo dar gaya wo mandir gaya we can also say jo dar gaya wo movie gaya <laughs> ultimately people when they watch movies what is happening there are so many problems so much stress in their life or their life is boring they want some stimulation so you could say that they are afraid of all the problems of their life they are afraid of the boredom of their life so f- just because fear is a motivation does not mean two things that fear is the only motivation and secondly what is being done because of fear is unhealthy so um, the point is that when we turn towards some power higher than ourselves that is prayer meditation spirituality these are not ways to escape from reality these are ways to equip ourselves to face reality better there are ways to equip ourselves so when our, when we connect ourselves through prayer through bhakti yoga with the divine what essentially happens is that connection gives us inner stability i'll give one example to illustrate this all of us are probably using some kind of entertainment isn't it even they're watching now if 1000 years down the line if somebody studied human society do you know what is the most expensive artifact like you know artifact something from ancient civilization that is passed on say people had some pots people had some architecture people had some paintings so what is the most expensive artifact that will go from today's society that that people 1000 years down the line will consider probably the most expensive artifact is movies 
there's hardly anything that is so regularly made and so much money is spent on it crores and crores of rupees are sometimes spent on some movies now recently there was the ipl according to one study that is that the, sh the amount of money that is transacted in the ipl is enough to feed all the hungry people all over india for a whole year and the point here is not to criticize entertainment the point here is just to contemplate you know, where is all this money coming from it is coming from all of us only people like us are ready to spend so much money that for entertainment and why are we ready to spend so much money because entertainment is addressing some need of ours and what is that need actually we may build a big house and we feel i want to come to come home to a comfortable house that's good it's good to have a comfortable house but just as we need a we need a shelter for our body we need also a shelter for our mind we need a we need some satisfying object of thought and for most of our life whatever we think about it just agitates us i used to write in the times of india in the speaking tree column and times of india was one of the first first uh, newspapers to start a spiritual column in india so when i was submitting articles i was talking with the editor over there and i asked her that how is it that uh, how did times of india get the idea of starting the spiritual column so she gave a revealing answer she said that you know, most of our news is about three things death destruction and deceit this accident killed this many people or this damage happened or this this corruption this scandal she said that so most of the newspaper has things that will agitate people's mind so we wanted to have one corner in our paper which will pacify people's minds <laughs> <laughs> that's why we started the speaking tree so the point is that we all need a satisfying object of thought and the our spirituality connects us so entertainment we watch some movie we see some sports and that pacifies our mind that's good but it doesn't really pacify in the sense that the problem goes away but just that we forget about it and we get some relief and that is good that we get some relief at least at that level but what we need really is lasting relief lasting stability and that satisfying object of thought is provided by spirituality spirituality tells us that beyond everything in this world all that beyond all that is changing there is an unchanging reality there is an unchanging divine and to the extent we connect with that divine to that extent that a sense of peace and clarity start coming into us many of you may have experienced that if you go to a temple or a holy place you just when you go there you feel some vibrations over there feel something peaceful something special about that place so what exactly is happening in our consciousness is directed toward that which is unchanging and when it's directed toward that which is unchanging then that stabilizes us that calms us down so uh, we all need so our weaknesses can agitate us oh why can't i do this why can't i do this but if that weaknesses prompt us to go towards spirituality to pray that can be a far more lasting gain than just simply overcoming that weakness so when we connect with the divine that connection lasts forever so entertainment and enlightenment enlightenment means connecting with not just some stimulating temp temporary titillating object but moving towards that which is eternal and unchanging so entertainment and enlightenment both can ultim can pacify our mind but the difference is that entertainment can only offer a little pacification entertainment is like a analgesic enlightenment is like the antiseptic entertainment is like the painkiller now what happens with the painkiller as soon as you take the painkiller it's cheap if you compare the cost of a painkiller with respect to antiseptic it will be cheap and you take it and you get relief but 
something goes wrong inside the dis disease is going further and further and then after that that level painkiller doesn't work and then you need a stronger dose and then you take that painkiller you get some relief but after that you need a still stronger dose so you can see how people's obs entertainment has always been a part of human society but the obsession with entertainment that is seen in today's world is unprecedented and that indicate the dependence on the painkillers is becoming more and more we need more and more dosages of painkillers so if you consider cricket you know, first there are five day matches then five days too slow you need a heavier dose painkiller <laughs> so we have one day matches <laughs> and then our one day that also is not a high enough dose so then we have t20 matches and then you know indians basically had two painkillers primarily one was cricket and the other was bollywood <laughs> and maybe about 10 years ago both these painkillers got married <laughs> and they begot a child that is ipl <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's like extremely heavy dose of painkiller again there's nothing against entertainment but obsession with entertainment is unhealthy so the point i was making is just as what whatever we are getting through entertainment basically we are getting relief from the boredom and the agitation of our daily life and yes sometimes when there is a lot there is a disease and a lot of pain painkiller is useful but the painkiller should not become a substitute for the medicine for the curative medicine for the antibiotic so if we grow spiritual spiritually then we connect with the supreme unchanging reality with krishna with god and by that connection we get inner stability and that stability will be a far greater asset than just some freedom from some weakness so i'll conclude with one example and then we can have some questions or comments if you have our weaknesses and even life's difficulties they sometimes hit us like waves suppose we are in an ocean and the wave hits us now to try to fight against that wave is very difficult say if, uh, a wave of anger a wave of envy a wave of depression it hits us now to use our will power and to push against that wave we'll soon get exhausted the waves are too strong but instead of trying to fight the wave if there is some anchor that we can hold on to and some strong immovable object some anchor that we hold on to now holding on to the anchor will also require strength and when the wave is sweeping we may get swept away and we may have to strain to hold on to that anchor also but comparatively speaking the energy required to hold on to an anchor is is far more effective than the energy simply to fight a wave so for us god is the ultimate anchor we can have various anchors our family can be an anchor we may have our <clears throat> some hobbies they might also be like anchors for us you know whenever i get i do something and make me peaceful but these are all also shakeable anchors the only unshakeable anchor is god and to the extent we connect with him so when we face our weaknesses and when they start overwhelming us we don't try primarily to fight against that weakness we focus on connecting with the divine and we hold on to the anchor if we just hold on to the anchor the wave will come the wave will shake us the wave may batter us but the wave won't sweep us away and like all waves the waves will come the waves will go but we all need this unchanging anchor in our life so our weaknesses can become strengths if they if we compare the weaknesses to be like waves hitting us and if the weaknesses make us look for an anchor the weaknesses make us learn to hold on to the anchor the weaknesses help us to discover the power of holding on to an anchor then that weakness can itself become our greatest strength so life can hurt us in many different ways but greater than the world's power to hurt is god's power to heal greater than the world's power to hurt is god's power to heal 
So if we turn towards God and connect with Him, whatever our weaknesses, they can become, they, we can still have a strength to go through those. And whatever our strengths, we can use them without becoming proud. I'll summarize. I spoke on this topic of how weaknesses can become strengths and strengths can become weaknesses. And I spoke within that also how spirituality can help us to deal with it. So with respect to strengths can become weaknesses. I talked about how people who are phenomenally talented are also prone to depression, emotional upheavals and even suicidal urges. Not just urges but also suicide. So why does this happen? Because often people who, are tal who have strengths, they start thinking that these strengths are mine. Not that they are gifts given to me, but that they are just mine. And to claim sole ownership of our own gifts, our own talents is too much of a burden. Because when those talents don't manifest through us, then we start beating ourselves up and we can't bear it. So I talked about how uh, when we appreciate someone, instead of a <clears throat> achievement-centered appreciation, it can be a, do you remember? Commitment-centered appreciation. Achievement-centered appreciation creates extrinsic self-worth. If I can't do this, if I do this, I'm great. If I can't do this, I'm useless. So most people go through this, uh, even achievers, they go through these two syndromes of grandiosity and inferiority. Because their self-worth has become very extrinsic. Intrinsic self-worth means that I will focus on doing the best that I can. It's commitment-centered. And whenever something higher wants to manifest through me, it will manifest. I'll be able to do extraordinary things. And when it doesn't, I'll just do the best that I can in that situation. So instead of saying that somebody is a genius, the traditional way was somebody has genius in them. That means there is the divine who is manifesting through them. So to have gifts is fortunate. To know that we have gifts is most fortunate. To know that our gifts are gifts is most fortunate. So if we become proud of our strengths, then we become arrogant. And not only do we alienate people, but also when we are not able to do what we think we should be able to do, then we beat ourselves up. We need to be responsible for our actions, but we don't need to blame ourselves for our actions. And our spirituality helps us to understand that our abilities come from God. And that's why we, stay, we use them to the best, but we don't become proud. So this strengths needn't become weaknesses if we are spiritual. And then our weaknesses, how can they become strength? I talked about weaknesses in terms of certain things which we just can't do. Certain abilities we have. So we understand that with respect to some abilities, we are, we are conductors. With some, we are semiconductors. With some, we might be insulators. So we understand this is not what I can do. And although it can be a painful inadequacy, the awareness of that inadequacy can create humility within us. Even in today's competitive, self-promotional kind of uh, corporate world, humility is an asset because it can foster team spirit. So humility ensures that, humility comes when we understand that I'm not God, that I have some strengths, but I also have some weaknesses. So if weaknesses can foster humility, then that's, that can become a strength. And further, if our weaknesses can foster spirituality, then they can become a, it can become a bigger strength for us. So we may feel, I don't need anything spiritual in my life. But we all need a satisfying object of thought. And that's why there is so much obsession with entertainment in today's world. Movies are probably the most expensive artifacts that today's people are making. So entertainment is useful, but it's like a painkiller. And the painkiller is cheap, it's easy to get. But it's not a lasting solution. If we just keep taking painkillers, then we need higher and higher dosages as is happening with respect to the passion in say sports like cricket. So enlightenment means it's not just that we, we while dealing with the world, we get a fed up and just go into some imaginary world and watch some movie or watch some sports. But rather we go from the changing nature of this world to an unchanging reality. And that connection with the unchanging will stabilize us. That connection with the unchanging is established through the practice of Bhakti Yoga and that becomes like our inner anchor. So when the world's problems hit us, that's like waves coming upon us. Trying to fight against the waves is almost impossible.
but holding on to an anchor amidst the waves is much easier so if our weaknesses can prompt us to seek an anchor and to discover the ultimate anchor of god then that weaknesses can help us to go towards the greatest strength and because of our weaknesses life may, the world may hurt us in many ways but greater than the world's power to hurt is god's power to heal thank you very much hare krishna any other questions or comments yes please sometimes when you are trying to become humble and you see that other person has started exploiting you hmm how to identify that now with the humility the exploitation has started okay yeah so how do we identify if because of our humility some exploitation has started so like i said humility means to not let our ego come in the way of our purpose so we have to be purpose centered so if somebody doesn't let us pursue our purpose itself then tolerating that is not humility that would be stupidity i would say <laughs> so i'll give a simple example say if we are traveling in a metro train maybe in mumbai if you consider locals the capacity is 50 and there are 300 people in it so people are squeezed together and say we are standing and there is some person who is a bully and we stand and they start pushing us and we think you think you are so strong i am also strong we push them back and they push us and we push them back and we get so caught in pushing and counter pushing that our destination comes and goes and we are still pushing <laughs> <laughs> you know that would be foolish so in that case humility means okay what's the big deal it's just a short journey half an hour 45 minutes you want you want to show your power i just move aside so humility what it does it for us in this context is is a small thing keep it small i i don't have to necessarily Uh, prove my strength or my superiority in every situation but suppose that person doesn't just push us that person starts pushing us out of the train itself and if we let ourselves be pushed out of the train that would be stupidity because then we that's interfering with our purpose so we have to have that perspective of what are small things and what are big things and humility means in one sense like if somebody is insulting us or disrespecting us or something like that okay it's not a big thing i can just tolerate it now everybody sometimes go through bad phases even the best of people sometimes they have bad mood they have bad days and they speak some something which hurts us now if it's now what is oh, i've written a book on the ramayana so there one of the essays i talk about is don't ascribe intention to what is spoken in tension <laughs> when somebody speaks or does something in tension don't ascribe intention to it okay keep it small let it be get over it hmm? but if somebody is intentionally malevolently hurting us again and again and that's just tormenting us so much then we need need to create some distance from them so if we we are purpose centered you now what have i come here for or why am i doing this if our purpose is clear then humility will become an aid in that but if our purpose is not clear that there can be either uh, we can either become too passive or too aggressive too aggressive means every small wrong we make a big issue of it every small thing we make it big and passive means even big things we don't take them seriously oh people are just trample over me what can i do it's not like that So if our purpose is clear then we can keep small things small and take a strong stand with respect to big things. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions? Yes from. So for me um, sometimes uh, especially in the corporate world uh, humility is seen as a weakness. Yeah. So how do we how can we be humble but not seen as weak? Mm, well how do we how can we be humble without being seen as weak to some extent i explained that humility means at one level in corporate world, we just open to other people's suggestions but uh, sometimes we have 
certain stereotyped conceptions of humility. Now, humility doesn't mean that we have to constantly be confessing our inability. I remember once in my early days, yeah, when I was just learning to speak in public, so there are a couple of my other friends also. So, uh, he, one of my friends was also giving a spiritual talk, just learning to give a talk. So, he said, he started his talk by saying, actually, I am a fool. I don't know anything. And all of you have come here to hear me, you are wasting your time. <laughs> Now, he was saying it in humility, but that is going to alienate your audience, isn't it? Why are you wasting your time? You can't, no, 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 don't come here, isn't it? So, that's kind of humility where we just speak, keep speaking about our inabilities in a way that alienates other people. That's not humility at all. That is actually just, you know, that's, that's, a, that's you could say almost like a uh, yeah, self-pity or negative self-obsession. See, some people are self-obsessed in a way how great I am. And some people are self-obsessed in how greatly poor I am. <laughs> so, when people are, people have say, see the difference between humility and say, inferiority complex is that humility is false ego rejected. Whereas inferiority complex is false ego frustrated. False ego frustrated. I want the whole world to think I am great. But what to do? I can't do anything great. So no. So I want to be great. But I can't be. That's false ego frustrated. But false ego rejected means no, I want to do something worthwhile. If people appreciate it, that's good. If they don't, but still I'll keep doing something worthwhile. So I would say that in the corporate world, if a particular role requires us to speak about our abilities, our accomplishments, we can always do that. Because that's what, uh, that's what is required for that particular service. We see even in the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, when warriors are about to fight, the warriors often speak about their abilities. You know, they, I have achieved this and I have defeated this, I, what can you do against me? That might seem almost like bragging. But at one level, in, when, when there is fighting, see fighting is not just a physical confrontation. It's also a mental confrontation. And whoever gets the upper hand in the mental game, they are much more likely to win. So then at that time, when somebody speaks about their own accomplishments, you know, I have defeated you 10 times. How, what do you think you can do now? So intimidation is also one strategy within confrontation. So if somebody is intimidating, intimidating the other person, is that ego? It could be. We can't guaranteedly say it's not an ego. But it doesn't have to be an ego. So, for specific purposes, if we need to speak about our accomplishments, our even if you want to use the word, our glories, our achievements, that's perfectly fine. The most of the time, what are we doing when we are interacting with people? If we are just cutting people short, if we are disrespecting them. It's very easy to understand people who are full of themselves. You know, they are just, they, anything that you speak, some people, they practice what is called autobiographical hearing. Mm -hmm. Autobiographical hearing is, if say you have, oh, you know, I fell sick. Oh, you know, what sickness you had? You know, I had a sickness 10 years ago. <laughs> and just start with themselves. <laughs> you know, it, this happened and that happened. You just don't hear anyone else. So I would say that humility, if we understand it as a tool of not being ego-centered, essentially being not being ego-centered, but purpose-centered, then it won't come off as weakness because where we need to take a strong stand, where we need to speak about our own accomplishment, we can do that. It's more of a overall disposition rather than a specific action. Does that address your question? Thank you. Yes, Ram. Taking a, you took the analogy of having a, a painkiller versus an antiseptic or antibiotic. Uh, the thing is that anti no. painkillers are easily available on over the counter and prescription required for any antibiotic. That's true. So, what happens is that like, it's easy to get 
uh, entertainment based on YouTube and there's so many things. So, mm. you know, you feel a little stressed and you pick up <coughs> your phone or your uh, computer and you start, it's, it's, it's there, right? And it, it immediately relieves <coughs> your pain or your stress that, that you are having versus, you know, having an antiseptic would require a doctor to identify you know, like a sickness, mm. what, is your, what is your problem, and then he needs to prescribe and get him to get it. So, you know, like, uh, it, it feels a little difficult, and it's, it's so easy to take this. So, how, how do we... Okay, do good question. So, painkillers can be very easily taken. Entertainment is always available to us. But for the antiseptic, we need a prescription from a doctor. For enlightenment, we need someone to give us. Well, every metaphor has its uh, intent and it also has its limitations. It is definitely true that entertainment is far more easily accessible to us than, uh, than enlightenment. But the fact is that entertainment sooner or later becomes unfulfilling. And that's why if we start uh, relying it on it as a default, then eventually we will want more and more and more and more. So, as I said, painkillers are not bad in themselves. In some cases, I was just giving this example in a, in a talk and after that talk, there was one doctor who was there in the talk, he mentioned that in some cases, actually painkillers can help in healing also. Because if somebody has got a very painful injury and then the body is so caught in responding to that pain that all of its energy is in trying to deal with that. If you been, the whole body muscles become tensed and whatever. And then you just give a painkiller. Although the pain is not cured, but the body relaxes. And then the body's energy can shift towards healing. The antiseptic can work faster. So in some cases, the painkiller can help in the healing also. But the real challenge is when the, the real danger is when the painkiller becomes a substitute for the main medicine, for the curative medicine. So, Krishna also in the Bhagavad Gita says, Yukta Ahara Viharasya. Be regulated in your eating and in your recreation. So, he's not saying reject recreation, but be regulated in it. So, broadly, what I find is that this is what you said about uh, this being easily available. That's universal. But it is good if we could find out some entertainment that also points towards enlightenment. That means if you like music, try to see if you can have, find some spiritual music. Yeah. If you like to read about something and try to find out something which is, if not spiritual directly, at least something wisdom centered. So we can, we, we don't necessarily have to see that these two are non-intersecting. They are they're definitely not identical circles, entertainment and enlightenment, but there is an overlap also in them. So we could situate ourselves in the overlap and then gradually move towards enlightenment. So, in keeping that regulated and also trying to have it in a way that is pointing towards enlightenment, that can help. So, another thing which we could do is that try to keep that which is uplifting easily accessible. Say for example, if you are feeling bored, now there might be some spiritual apps which also contain something stimulating. We have for example say a Darshan app which has beautiful pictures of Krishna. And now keep that on your phone home page and then you know, sometimes uh, we have to sometimes trick the mind. See the mind wants something new. So what, what we do is like uh, this one day with, with I am working to make an app. It's basically we have so much spiritual wisdom to read. The Bhagavad Gita is there, the Bhagavatam is there. So what happens is, it is there but it is so big that we hardly ever read it. So what we are working on is that you create apps which will be like random extract generators. So you open that app and some, some random words from the Bhagavad Gita will come up. Some random text from the Bhagavatam will come up. So then what happens? The mind wants something new. Oh, this is new. Let me read it. So we have to find out with our mind how we can, in a sense, trick it. So we have to learn how the mind can learn the best. 
so the we could say that the mind our own mind which is habituated to certain things it is you could compare it to uh, a child with dyslexia now it, such children are not untalented they may also be brilliant in their own ways but you know the parents and the caregivers have to learn how to help their child to learn sometimes they can't see see letters so then you have to have something else so so it requires time so similarly we observe ourselves don't just condemn ourselves oh i just waste so much time on this we can't be too hard with ourselves on this but at the same time we can't be too lax with ourselves also so learn how we can help ourselves to learn okay thank you So you know, applause can be for appreciation, or it can be for conclusion. <laughs> okay. Okay. We have time. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, please. It's not conclusion. Okay. Yeah, please. Yeah, you can. Yeah. This this came uh, out of a, a conversation I heard with my friend. Okay. Uh, we are seeing Michael Phelps. He is uh, winning and winning uh, the medals right in the Olympics. Should he again? Okay. If he, he feel he will definitely win in the in the game. Should he compete or not? Why should he not compete? Why should he not compete? If somebody has abilities. what's wrong with using those abilities no but if if he definitely win if he feels that he will definitely win then is it better to give chance to others or he again competent and win that game okay so if we have abilities should we just use those abilities uh, to uh, to just uh, dominate others and win over others should we also give others chances so these are very individual decisions generally uh, the in key point is that each of us should want to make a contribution if we have been given some abilities with that we make a contribution so there can be competition which is constructive and competition that is destructive competition that is destructive means say different people are trying to climb up a climb up say a hill and destructive competition is whoever is behind they pull the other person down constructive competition is the presence of others inspires us to become better so it's always good to have constructive competition but destructive competition is definitely undesirable so if we have certain abilities then if we want to achieve something with that ability that's good but we can after see after some time even the joy of achievement starts diminishing everything in the world has a law of diminishing returns and that same person may start feeling that okay how can i contribute better so maybe i have these abilities with these abilities i can train others i can assist others i can help them grow so they, so we can see what gives us we all need some satisfaction ourselves but after some time just our own satisfaction will not give us enough satisfaction so in a sense you can say there is something which gives me satisfaction and there is something by which i do a contribution and when i help others that also gives me a different kind of satisfaction so in the early early phases of our life we would be very self centered i this gives me pleasure this is what i want to do but after some time we all evolve and then we get satisfaction in doing something for others also there are great leaders who can do phenomenal things but the greatest leaders are those who make other great leaders so that's also a much more valuable way in which you can contribute so for doing that also sometimes we may have to talk about our abilities and accomplishments but that is very different from talking about our abilities and accomplishments for our own personal gratification okay thank you you had a question yeah i was just going to comment on uh, yeah please uh, okay can you can you just complete let her address oh, okay thank, thank you No, okay, both of you in that direction only. Fine, <laughs> thank you. Yes. I was just reflecting on your uh, comments on extrinsic and uh, intrinsic self-worth, right? And relating it to parenting, because I think often as parents, uh, we, it's easy to.
to kind of promote that extrinsic self-worth mm. in children because we want them to do well. So when they bring in those good marks, we praise them, right? Uh, would you say it's like with, uh, in terms of with parenting, to try to focus on instilling that intrinsic self-worth, just focus on the process and the efforts that they're putting towards, uh, whether it's school or even towards bhakti, like that process of coming here, they may not be able to comprehend everything, right? The key concepts, but at least they're sitting here and listening, right? So is that... Yes, or definitely. Trying to relate it to parenting. Yes, so definitely. So we encourage, should we encourage our children to just participate, to, to focus on the process, not so much on the product? Right. Not, yes, not definitely, product. definitely. Because it's not just with respect to intrinsic self-worth or extrinsic self-worth, definitely that's there. But also, it's also important that, say, say if children are playing, now all children play, whenever they're playing any game, they want to win. But you know, for the children, for to be able to play, they need to be basically likable. Now, uh, if children start trying to win at all costs and they become obnoxious and after some time, then other kids say, I don't want to play with you. Then that's a much bigger loss. So, for it's not just one game that they are playing, it is the iteration of games they are going to play. So, it's, uh, it's not just, to, we often tell, we may tell our children also sometimes, you know that, it's how you play that matters. It's not whether you win. Now what does it mean? It just means that life is bigger than any one match. And if somebody is basically likable, people want to play with them, then that is going to help them much more than just somebody just winning one particular game. So same way, if we focus on the process, it does help them to do that which will help them to grow. See, the, the product the product you could say is the result of growth but the process is the means to growth so we need to everybody also needs a sense of success in their lives and it is also our responsibility to try as much as possible to help them get that sense of success we can't just tell that oh you just are doing the process everything is fine no so we have to make sure that they also get some success and uh, we appreciate them for the success it's not that achievement is inconsequential it's definitely important but the commitment is much more important thank you yes thank you yes please so Swamiji, uh, you know, like uh, just by going by the introduction with uh, Raghun Bhai gave about you, you seem to be doing very well professionally you know, back in the day. So what uh, rather you, I mean, you know, to leave everything and, you know, take to this part, what was the trigger point? I mean, there are a lot of people who may think about renouncing, who, who actually think about renouncing everything and, you know, take into the spiritual path, but they are not able to. You did that. So what, what kind of, you know, Okay, it's a, what triggered you me to take to the spiritual path? I could give many different answers for that in the sense that from different perspectives, but connected with today's talk, mm, I would say that that I, since my childhood, had a dream that I wanted to be in India I use a topper, the number one, and I was always. Uh, very good student and I was always getting that among the top ranks second, third, joint first but never the first so that was my childhood dream and um, after my 10th and then 12th I did well I was among quite well I did quite well both my 10th and 12th I had to do engineering because that's what everybody was doing I had an uncle in America who wanted me to come in inherit his company so it was my life trajectory was already planned out in some ways but then while I was studying engineering I just I gave GRE in the people given the fourth year I gave my third year first semester itself and since my childhood I loved English very much one of my hobbies was just to pick up a dictionary and memorize meanings of words so I generally Indians have a little difficult that time we had uh, out of 2400 GRE we had uh, English language and mathematical ability and analytical ability. So those three were there. 
so when i gave gre because my english was very good at that time i came first not just in my college but also in the history of my college and not just in my college it was like so i was first in uh, the whole state of maharashtra at that time you know among the toppers so now i was delighted and i was you could say in the seventh heaven for some time but after some time it struck me that in just looking at that score doesn't give much pleasure so then of course many of my friends congratulated me and it is very happy but somehow it happened uh, that three of my friends one after another forgot to congratulate me now they thought everybody knows about it everybody is talking about it what is the point in congratulate that no malefied intention on their part but when the first person didn't congratulate me i was annoyed <laughs> the second person didn't congratulate me i was irritated the third person didn't congratulate me i was infuriated and, it, and still it's you, you can't be so pathetic to ask somebody why are you not congratulating me <laughs> <laughs> so at that time as i was getting this infuriated there are times in my life when somehow it happens that i so i sort of look at myself from a out of body perspective not literally but conceptually so sir i am sitting here and i'm looking at myself so like that so at that time it just happened to me and i said i looked at myself and i said hey, wait a minute i thought that topping in that becoming a topper will make me happy but here it has simply made me more dependent for my happiness on others so i could achieve something i may crack another exam in future but the same thing is going to happen again so that's the time i started thinking that you know what is real happiness what is it that if i achieve it will give me happiness that is not dependent on externals so some of that was the time when one of my friends gave me a bhagavad gita i had recited bhagavad gita in my childhood in shloka recitation competitions but i had never read it so then i started reading it and then i came to 6.22 in the bhagavad gita it says yam labdhva cha param labham manyate nadhikam tatah yasmin sthito na dukhena guruna api vichalyate it's talking about a state of consciousness of spiritual absorption in the result of that is once you achieve this there is nothing more to be achieved one doesn't crave for anything more and once we have achieved that we will not lament the loss of anything difficulties may come but we won't lose that we won't uh, be devastated by that so i started thinking at that time is there anything that i can achieve in my life which will free me from craving and lamenting there's nothing else this is a state of spiritual absorption so that was what inspired me and then i started practicing the teachings of the bhagavad gita in my life and i started sharing with other students also other friends in my college and i could see myself changing i started becoming i was infamous for my short temper at that time i still i sometimes get angry but it's if you consider a graph it is like it is like touching the sky now it is like this it's much much lesser so uh, so i found it changing and one of my friends was sliding into addiction and to alcoholism at that time and then he, he, i introduced him and initially he was not all interested but he somehow became interested and he just gave up all his unhealthy habits so i was quite enlivened to see the changes were happening in me and in others then i joined a multinational software company worked for some time and then i had also started giving talks so once i was supposed to give a, go to university with a small talk i was supposed to give a small group of students but at that time i was my boss told me that i was working at you know we have to do some work some uh, urgent work had come up he said you have to do this so i said thinking i i of course couldn't go because the boss told me but we couldn't arrange anyone else for that program so then the students came but there was nobody to speak so after that i started thinking that if i don't work as a software engineer there are 100 other people who will do this job 
But if I don't share spiritual knowledge, how many other people are there to do that? So I felt at that time that I could contribute much better to society by sharing spiritual wisdom than by writing software programs. So that's what I'm trying to do now. <laughs> So I think that was for conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, one last question. Yeah, please. Okay, whenever we succeed, we feel happy about it. But how, so how can we be happy without being proud? Yeah, um, I say three broad things for this. First is that whenever we succeed, we recognize that actually for my success, my effort was there. But so many other factors also have to fall in place. Only then that success will come. Mm. Uh, I write on the Bhagavad Gita every day at a website, uh, gitadaily.com. So I wrote an article on this famous verse, Karman Nevadhikaraste, Mafale Shukadachana. So that article, I guess the title, Performance Matters, but performance is not all that matters. So even in a field like sports, which is very performance driven, in sports players have their quirky superstitions. There was an Australian batsman. Australia was known to be at least a 10 12 years ago. They were known to be very tough in it to win it. That was their mood. So this Australian batsman, whenever he would go to bat, he before that he would go to the pavilion commode and make sure all the lids would be closed. <laughs> and then he would go to bat. And if he would get out early, he wouldn't go to the pavilion, he would go to the commodes. And if any lid would be open, he would go and snap at his team members. Why did you keep that open? I got out because of that. <laughs> now you may say, what has the commode lid being open got to do with this getting out? But the point is, every sports player recognizes that there is something beyond me which affects me. And in their own quirky way, they are trying to appease that unknown. Somebody might put an earring only in one ear. Somebody might put a handkerchief which is half in, half out. So, so, so basically, Whenever we are able to succeed, we look also at the things that are not in our control, which worked out right. So that will ensure that we don't become proud. We were happy that what we did, we were able to do our part well. So happiness, see, we, Bhagavad says, Ma faleshu kadachana, Ma karma fal heturbhur. Do not think that you are the cause of the result. That what does it mean? That we, of course we are the cause, but we are not the sole cause. So to the extent we think we are the sole cause, we will become proud. But to the extent we, okay, my part was there and I did my part well. So for that I am happy and there is other things fell in place. So therefore uh, this, the result came out and I am happy for that. So by seeing that which is not in our control, that also worked out right that can avoid, that can prevent pride. Another thing which we could do is that we can thank God for whatever works out right. Instead of making, taking credit for our success, we can give thanks for the success. So when by that what happens? Our focus shifts from ourselves. See pride basically comes when we think I, I am great. But if we are shifting our attention to someone who is bigger than us, then that pride doesn't have to come. So at least it will not come so much. So thanking and acknowledging, you know, there are this famous, famous prayers, Narayana Yeti Samar Payami. So the whole mood over there is what? That whatever I am doing, I am offering to you. So by your grace, I was able to do this well and I offer it to you. Thank you for enabling me to offer this and please accept it. So if we, we can do this, yeah, then again the pride will not come in. Basically if we see something 
not just something that is out of our control working out right but someone personal some personal being who is helping us that can also prevent pride and thirdly with respect to the happiness that we get it's we all need happiness as i said we all need a sense that a sense of success in uh, in our life otherwise just one after another after another reversals will dishearten us but what we could do with respect to that happiness is that we focus more on learning than on uh, parading or exhibiting yes i'm happy that this worked out this this happened but what did i do right at that time the happiness might be there but if you shift up what did i do right and how can i learn from it so if you have that mood of learning see learning itself brings a mood of learning brings humility so that way also we can avoid pride because as i said even when we do something right it's not just we doing it right now when whenever say i speak sp uh, speak on something spiritual there are many times when certain thoughts certain examples certain ideas certain points just come through which even i may have not thought, thought of them before they are broadly in consonance with the with the wisdom of the spiritual texts but you know, sometimes when we do something right we do it more than what we have practiced also or what we have learned so then we if we have that learning mood then that also helps us to prevent pride i was i was a few months ago attending a talk by one of my friends and he spoke a brilliant point and after that i appreciated him that was such a brilliant point and he gave me a strange look i said what happened he said i heard this point in your class only <laughs> <laughs> so i had spoken that four around four years ago and i had completely forgotten it so then i it struck me that you know i can't claim that this is knowledge which i am giving if i don't even remember what i spoke so much that even if somebody else speaking is not reminding me so we can just recognize that even what we do it's not we alone doing it so if we have that mood of learning then also we can be happy but not become proud okay so thank you very much hare krishna do we have books books we have books we have yeah, yeah books we have. Okay, so can I just speak? Yeah. yeah.